So what we're going to study today is um, Sunday in the New Testament. Now, for those of us who've been exposed to the Sabbath and understand the Sabbath, these, some of these texts will be very familiar. Um, for those of us who are not, they, they are texts that are going to be brought up to us because all Sunday keepers, if they know anything about a little bit about the Bible, they will bring up these verses that we're going to have a look at and that's why it's important for us to uh, look at these together. So uh, off we go. And uh, we're going to notice that the, uh, the Catholic Church, as that little uh, outline that we gave you, the green sheet will give you the evidence for the change that the Catholic Church has brought in and we'll discuss why they are so keen. The attempted change of the Sabbath to Sunday. This is reviewing what we discussed last week. First of all, God does not change. Is that right? Same yesterday, today and forever. His law does not change. Doesn't come in and out. Thirdly, Jesus did not change the Sabbath in the New Testament. Um, and fourthly, the apostles did not change the Sabbath. Fifthly, the New Testament did not change the Sabbath, despite the fact that many have been brought up to believe that. Sixthly, Daniel predicted the Antichrist would change God's times and law. Now, that's what you studied last week, and that's just a review of the major points that uh, we went through last week. And the Church of Rome clearly admits to have changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. And those, uh, that outline that we gave you clearly admits that. Um, there is um, no um, question about it. They, they do not hide the fact that they changed the Sabbath. The only people who try to hide it are Protestants. But the Catholic Church doesn't change. Um, this is a little book that you can still get today, it's still in print and if you haven't got it, it's worthwhile getting hold of. Why do Protestants keep Sunday? This is Rome's challenge, meaning that Rome has put out a challenge to all Sunday keeping Protestant churches. And uh, the Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant by virtue of her divine mission changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. Now that's a quote from the Catholic Church. So uh, they're saying the, the essence of this little book, Rome's Challenge, and they give all the evidence for it, is the fact that for a thousand years we changed the day before a Protestant ever came into existence. And um, so there it is. The Sabbath is part of the eternal, changeless Ten Commandments law of, um, of God. And... Uh, we have seen that. Jesus gave humankind the Sabbath and the Garden of Eden as a memorial of his creative power. And that's the, uh, the, the, the major purpose of the Sabbath was to remind us of creation. That's why the fourth commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. So the, the purpose of the Sabbath is to remind us of creation. Uh, you know, like the statement that we have on Anzac Day, lest we forget, because humankind is very likely to forget. And uh, God knew that. The Sabbath will be kept for all eternity in the new earth. Isaiah 66 says that very, very clearly. And um, the purpose of the Sabbath is to provide time for God's people to build a solid relationship with him. You know, apart from being legalistic, as many Christians believe this, if you keep the Sabbath, you're a legalist, it's actually the opposite to that because the Sabbath gives us 24 hours to get to know God every week. We have a divine appointment with God. And uh, the Sabbath is certainly not legalism, it's, um, it's a very day full of grace and uh, in our relationship with him. Does the little horn power have authority to change the Sabbath day? Does it? Well, the answer to that is, what would be needed to prove that Sunday is the new day of worship? See, what would be needed? 
If, if Sunday is the new day of worship, what would we need in order to show that, to prove that? Yes, we would need a specific text or command by someone of authority to obliterate the Sabbath. All right, that's the first thing we would need. The Sabbath's been done away with. A clear statement that says that. Secondly, a specific new commandment to observe the first day of the week as a new day of worship. Right? So now we need a second commandment which says very clearly that Sunday is the Sabbath. And thirdly, we, have clear ex we would need clear examples of Sunday worship by New Testament Christians led by the Apostles. Now I'm going to suggest that they're the three criteria that we would need if Sunday is the new day of worship. All right. Um, well, in the New Testament, there's only eight texts, just eight, that talk about the first day of the week. And I want to have a look at those uh, eight texts now because uh, that's what our lesson, first of all, the first section of our lesson is about. Would the little horn actually change God's times and laws? What does the text say? Shall? What's the next word? think or shall intend to change times and laws. Some of the versions say think. So no one can change the law of God but this power is going to think himself or intend to. Get the idea? Um, because nobody can change the law. Um, he just thinks he can. What happened on the first day of the week according to Matthew 28? Now, when we talk about these eight texts, five of them refer to the same Sunday. And there they're grouped together. Matthew 28, 1 and 2, Mark 16, 1 and 2 and 9, Luke 23, 56 and 24, 1 and John 20, verse 1. All referring to exactly the same Sunday of the resurrection. And uh, so once again, what happened on the first day of the week? What was it? Jesus rose from the dead. And um, we can easily prove that because um, some very strong evidence. We'll have a look at that. The, the first five texts about Sunday, they say nothing about keeping this day in honour of the resurrection. All right? Now, if the day has been brought in to honour the resurrection, then we would expect a statement to be made to say that that's the case, all right? But uh, we don't find that. What day is mentioned as coming before the first day of the week? In all of those verses, those five verses, what's the day that's called first? The Sabbath. So the Bible is clear that the Sabbath is mentioned and in all of those five texts, then it talks about the first day of the week. So... Um, Good Friday, the, the day before the Sabbath, you have Saturday, the Sabbath according to the commandment, and Easter Sunday. Let me just explain that. Because the whole world is agreed on these three days. When I say the whole world, I mean the whole world. For example, all Christians are agreed that Christ was crucified on what we call Good Friday. Isn't that right? Just about, apart from a few that believe in the Wednesday crucifixion theory, but apart from that, just about every single Christian is agreed that Christ died on Good Friday. That's why it's called Good Friday or Easter Friday. Um, Saturday, every Jew and Seventh-day Adventist around the world all is agreed that Saturday is the seventh day of the week. So you've got uh, the Christians now and you've got the Jews and the Adventists. Then Easter Sunday, the first day of the week, that's the only reason that I've ever heard from Sunday keepers to say that they keep Sunday because Christ rose on that day. That's the only reason I've ever, ever heard from a Sunday keeper. And yet there's no verse that says that. And by the way... Um, these days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you've got the Muslims, and there's a th over a thousand million of them in the world. They all will tell you that Friday is the sixth day of the week. Is that right? Because that's the day they go to their mosques. 
So you've got a thousand million Muslims all agreed on the sixth day of the week. You've got um, over a thousand million Christians who will tell you that Sunday is the first day of the week. And you've got Jews and Adventists who will clearly tell you that the seventh day is Saturday. So there's not too many things that you can say the Muslims, the Christians and the Jews all agree on. But they do agree on these three days. Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So I say the whole world is agreed on this particular point. And I don't know of too many other things that you can say the Jews, the Muslims and the Christians all agree on. But they do agree on these three days. Because it's, it's so clear, biblically, um, and uh, from history. What is the memorial of the death, the burial and the resurrection of Christ? What does the Bible say is the memorial? Because the Bible has a memorial of his death and resurrection. What, what is it? Baptism. baptism, yes. We don't need another memorial. We've already got one, baptism. And uh, the idea of Sunday being a memorial of the resurrection is superfluous because we have baptism as the memorial of his resurrection. Because every person who's baptised is baptised as they are lowered under the water and raised again in newness of life and it's because these churches have substituted a man-made baptism that they have lost the significance of biblical baptism by immersion. And when you understand biblical baptism by immersion you don't need another memorial of Sunday because you already have one. Get the idea? In the, in the changed life of the believer who dies, whose life is buried in the water and whose life then is resurrected from the water in baptism. Baptism, the death, burial and resurrection to new life in Christ. That's what baptism memorialises. And that's why the devil has attacked the method of baptism, still has water with sprinkling and so forth, but there's no significance in sprinkling water on either a baby or an adult because... Um, it's the method of baptism which is significant. It is not the water, but the method. But what happened with the, with the church when it got away from the Bible is that they thought that the, the water was significant and they called it holy water, when in actual fact it's not the water that's significant, it's the method. Get the idea? And the devil got rid of that method of uh, baptism by immersion. Why were the disciples assembled on the first day of the week? Now, I've had many ministers, Sunday-keeping ministers, tell me that this is the verse that proves that the disciples were meeting on the first day of the week in honour of the resurrection. Now, what does the verse say? Because the disciples assembled on the first day of the week for fear of the Jews. Did they believe that Christ was resurrected at this stage? No, they didn't believe, even believe it. And they were fearful that what happened to Christ was going to happen to them. And uh, so they were huddled together for fear of the Jews, it says. They weren't worshipping God at all. They were frightened little kittens. And uh, the Bible makes it clear for fear of the Jews. The disciples were not holding a meeting to honour the resurrection. They did not even believe in the resurrection at this point. They were meeting behind locked doors for fear that the same thing that happened to Jesus would happen to them. So, uh, yes. What did Paul ask the Corinthian Christians to do on the first day of the week? This is interesting. This is another verse because the Sunday keepers will often tell you that this verse shows that they took up an offering in church on the first day of the week. I've been told this many times. They're taking up an offering, therefore they were meeting together in church. Well, that's not what the verse says at all. What does the verse say? On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. What's going on here? What's Paul talking about when he says, each one of you lay aside something, storing it, uh, as the Lord prospers them? What's, what's happening here? Hmm? 
Yes, what, what he's saying is on the first day of the week after the Sabbath, when you've given your offering on Sabbath, then you start on Sunday laying aside some money for the end of the week. Because remember, they didn't have banks back in those days. You had to look after your own money. And so he's saying, put aside some money in store that um, as the Lord blesses you. Lay something aside storing. That's not a collection in church. Because if that was a collection in church, they wouldn't use that wording. That would be very, very different wording. So that verse doesn't prove what they're trying to make it out to prove, that it was an offering on, Sabbath, on, on Sunday. Not at all. Paul was collecting for the poor in Jerusalem who were suffering from famine. A bit like what's happening in Australia at the moment. There was a big famine in the land at the stage. And um, he was instructing the Corinthian believers to lay aside at home each week a certain amount of money for this special offering. And he said, when I come around, you can give me the offering and I'll take it over to Jerusalem to the believers. Get the idea? That's what he was uh, saying to them. This was an individual saving scheme for the poor in Jerusalem. There is absolutely nothing in this text to suggest it was a regular Sunday morning church offering. The offering was saved up at home. So I think that uh, point is very clear. But we need to labour it because this is amazing how people will read into verses that which is not there. 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 to 4 says, Regarding the relief offering for poor Christians that is being collected, you get the same instructions gave the church in Galatia. Every Sunday, each of you make an offering and put it in safekeeping. Be as generous as you can. Now that's the message translation of those verses. That's not the normal translation, but um, the message was translated by a Sunday keeper. Not, this is not a Sabbath keeping translation. They, they're Sunday keepers. And it says, regarding the relief offering for poor Christians that has been collected, you get the same instructions gave the church in Galatia. Every Sunday, each of you make an offering and put it in safekeeping. So, when I get there, you'll have it ready and I won't have to make a special appeal. Then after I arrive, I'll write letters authorising whomever you delegate and send them off to Jerusalem to deliver your gift. So in this verse, Paul was saying he wasn't going to be the one. He would, he would um, give it to the person that you nominate to take it over to Jerusalem. Does Acts 20, verses 7 to 11, indicate that the first day was the regular meeting day of the early church? Now this is another favourite verse of Sunday Keepers to suggest that Sunday was, um, or the first day of the week was their day of worship. Let's have a look. The answer to that is no. And we'll have a look now at what the text says. Now on the first day of the week, you can see why they get excited. Now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. All right? Ah, now they're really getting excited. Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. On Saturday evening... Now, this is the translation in the New English Bible. On Saturday evening, we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight, since he was going to leave the next day. All right, let's just go back. And you remember the story of Eutychus? Paul spoke for so long, he went to sleep, remember? And he fell off. And uh, he must have hit his head because he was dead. And Paul raised him back to life again. <coughs> now let's just go back to the um, old version where it says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. All right? So if he's preaching on the first day of the week and he continues through until midnight, in our language, what day would that be? What time would that be? What would we call that time? We wouldn't refer to it as the first day of the week um, here in Australia simply because we go by a different... Um, yes, we don't go by sunset, we go from midnight to midnight. So in actual fact, 
when is Paul preaching here? Is it the light part of the day or the dark part of the day? The dark part of the day, which means that if it's the dark part of the first day of the week, what part of the day is that in our language? Is that Sunday night or Saturday night? If it's the first day of the week and he preaches through till midnight, it's Saturday night. Because when, sun, when the first day of the week comes to an end at sunset, so there's no dark part of the first day of the week after Saturday night. Because like tonight, biblically, Sunday will start at sunset tonight. Isn't that right? So the first part of Sunday is the dark part. Then followed by the light part, right? Because that's why Genesis says the evening and the morning were the first day. The evening always comes first, followed by the morning or the light part. Get the idea? So he was preaching on the dark part of the first day of the week, which we call Saturday night. And that's why the translation here in the Good News Bible, which is not an Adventist Bible, this is once again translated by Sunday Keepers, says on Saturday evening we gathered together for the fellowship meal. Paul spoke to the people and kept on speaking until midnight since he was going to leave the next day. In other words, he would travel on the light part of the first day of the week, which he wouldn't do on the Sabbath. <coughs> because Paul kept the Sabbath holy. He wouldn't be travelling on the Sabbath. He would leave that till Sunday. Get the idea? <coughs> Does that make sense? That's a very important verse to understand because I can tell you this, you got talking to people and they will bring this verse up for sure. And you need to uh, know your way around it <coughs> and how to help them. And it goes on to say, In a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus. He was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continues speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. <laughs> you can understand the situation, can't you? I mean, you can see the, the humour of it. and It's not funny, but I, you can see him sitting up there and Paul going on and on and on for hours and he falls asleep and then, you know what it's like when you fall asleep. Your muscles relax and up, down he went. Yes. <coughs> but Paul went down, fell on him, embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak. In other words, he continued now, even after midnight, he continued right through until dawn. So those of us who are only used to three quarters of an hour sermon, this went all night. And, uh, and you can understand that from Paul's point of view because he would believe that probably this would be the last time that he would ever see these believers. And he was leaving on the next day and so he wanted to spend as much time with the people as he possibly could. Then he went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asos, there intending to take Paul on board, for so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. But when he met us at Asos, he took him on board and came to Mytilene. And that's, in Acts. that's just the text reading on from the verses that talk about the first day of the week. So let's review the events of Acts 20. It says here, first of all, it's Saturday evening, the first day of the week. It's the first thing we notice. Secondly, Paul preaches till midnight. Um, sometime after midnight, Eutychus falls out of the window and dies. Paul raises him up and continues talking till daybreak, Sunday morning. Sunday morning, his friends sail to Asos while Paul walks 20 kilometres. That's a fair distance, isn't it? You've been up all night preaching, then you walk 20 kilometres. So you can understand uh, the guy was pretty fit. And six, Paul joins them at Asos and they sail to Mytilene. That's a pretty clear summary, isn't it? Of, uh, of the points that uh, we're raising there. All right? This was a special farewell meeting on Saturday night lasting till Sunday morning. 
after which Paul walked 20 kilometres and went uh, sailing. So we've been over that. What were the ceremonial feast days called in question 8? Because we've dealt now with those eight verses in the New Testament. Acts, uh, Acts 20 was the last one that we dealt with. But there are ceremonial feast days called. What were they originally called? They were called Sabbaths too. Hmm? Yes, they were um, what we call annual Sabbaths, kept once a year, like Christmas or Easter in the sense of once a year. And like Christmas, they all fell on a different day every year. Get the idea? Like Christmas does. Uh, it's a different day. So these ceremonial Sabbaths were tied to dates. And the date fell on a different day every year. Now sometimes those days or the events coincided with the seventh day Sabbath. And when the ceremonial Sabbath and the weekly seventh day Sabbath fell on the same day, what was it called in the New Testament? It was called a high day. Yeah, a high day. You'll read occasionally in the New Testament. It was a high day. And that's what it means. It means that the ceremonial Sabbath, and that is the Passover, and the seventh day Sabbath fall on exactly the same day. And it will do that every seven years. Just like Christmas falls on the same day every seven years. Doesn't it? It goes through the week, and then seven years later it will fall on the same day it did seven years ago. So is it, now we, we need to understand this because this is somewhere else that some Christians don't understand and it leads to mistakes. So there were, there were a number of these Sabbaths that the Bible refers to as Sabbaths. There were seven of them, in fact. And I think we're going to list them for you here. These were biblical holy days. There were the spring holy days in the spring part of the year and then there was the autumn fall days. For example, the spring days, Passover, and once again, Passover Sabbath was a particular event that fell on a particular date, right? But a different day every year. Are you with me? Do you understand that? Tied to a date, but that means the date fell on a different day each year. Just like Christmas, the 25th of December doesn't always hit the same day. It, it changes. So these Sabbaths change. There was Passover, there was the first fruits, which, which was a type of the resurrection. There was Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and the unleavened bread which indicated the burial of Jesus. Now, on the autumn holy days, there were the Day of Trumpets, there were the Feast of Tabernacles, and then there was the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Um, so there were three in the autumn and uh, four in the uh, spring. And Leviticus 23 states that these sacred ceremonial holy days were to be kept like the weekly Sabbath in that no ordinary work was to be done. They were ceremonial Sabbaths separate to the weekly Sabbath. So the Bible makes a very clear distinction between the ceremonial ones that were held once a year and the seventh day Sabbath that was held weekly. Um... And sometime we ought to have a study of these. It's a wonderful study uh, and see the fulfilment of each of these. In addition to the ceremonial Sabbaths, what other Sabbath were the children of Israel to keep? It says, These are the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations or holy meetings besides the Sabbaths of the Lord. So the Bible makes it clear that the feast days were different to the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the Lord. 
All right? So you've got that in your text. The Old Testament makes a clear distinction between the seventh day Sabbath of God's law, which is the memorial of Christ's past work of creation, and the annual, or once a year, ceremonial feast day Sabbaths, which typified the future work of Christ for our salvation. So each of these feast days, like Pentecost, Day of Atonement, Trumpets, and so all of those pointed forward to an aspect of Christ's work of salvation for us. Get the idea? Because Christ's work is so much greater than any type, anything that we can come up with, that's why it requires lots and lots of illustration so that we can understand the full nature of Christ's work of redemption for us. And uh, this is what the statement here is, uh, is saying. Which Sabbaths does the Apostle Paul say New Testament believers are not to be judged on? Now here, this is once again a, a, a very important verse. Colossians 2 says, Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come. All right, let me just pause here for a moment. The seventh day Sabbath, was it a, was it a shadow of anything? Well, perhaps we ought to define what do we mean by a shadow? What does the Bible mean by the shadow? If I'm standing here and the sun is shining on me from this angle, what's going to be behind me? A shadow. And the shadow, if you follow the shadow, it will come back to the substance, which is me in this case. So what the Bible is saying is that these Sabbaths were a shadow of the things to come, meaning of Jesus and his work. The seventh day weekly Sabbath was never a shadow of anything because when was it made? Before sin came into the world or after? Before sin came into the world. Therefore, the, ne the death of Jesus was not yet necessary when the Sabbath was introduced. Get the idea? When the Sabbath was made, Jesus' death still wasn't necessary. Jesus' death only became necessary after man sinned. And the Sabbath was made in the Garden of Eden before man sinned. That's why the Bible never says that the seventh day Sabbath is a shadow of anything. But all of these other Sabbaths, Pentecost or, or Passover, Passover was a shadow of what? When the angel of death passed over and the Egyptians and, and slayed the firstborn, what was that a shadow of? when the angel of death passed over and those who had the blood on the lintel of the door were saved, what's that prefiguring? Yeah, Jesus' death on the cross. Because as we accept that, that blood and claim it, then the angel of death passes over us. So it was a figure, it was a symbol, it was a reminder of the fact that Jesus one day was going to die. When Jesus died on the cross, we no longer celebrate the Passover because now we have the substance. We're up with the reality now. The shadow has, has met its, its reality. Get the idea? The reality is Jesus. But all through the Old Testament, that was the shadow time. But when Jesus came, that uh, finished. That's why, as I said, I don't celebrate the feast days anymore. And the New Testament says we shouldn't. And this verse is very clear on it. It says, Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, we are not to keep those any longer. Because Jesus, it's a denial of Jesus because he has come in the reality. And uh, all of those things simply pointed forward to Jesus. Every one of those seven annual Sabbaths all pointed to an aspect of Jesus' work, Pentecost. Day of Atonement, Trumpets, whatever it is, they all pointed forward to a different aspect of Christ's uh, salvation work. What was nailed to the cross? According to Colossians 2, 14 to 17, it says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances, that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, I have some of my dear Sunday-keeping friends who want to tell me that this does away with the Ten Commandments. 
because there's blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. And my first question to those who say that is, what part of the Ten Commandments are against us? For example, if every person here in Blacktown kept the Ten Commandments, would that make Blacktown a good place to live or a bad place? Very good. Everyone would want to live here because there would be no crime, no thieving, no adultery, nothing. Everyone would be living a very, very good life and everyone would want to live in that environment. So the Ten Commandments are not against us, but if you had to cut the throat of a little lamb every time you sinned, how would that appeal to you? I tell you, it wouldn't appeal to me at all and I'm sure it wouldn't appeal to you it, because it was against our nature. We, our, our nature's recall from causing death um, and um, so blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, took it out of the way, led, nailing it to his cross. Then it says, Paul says, let no man therefore judge you in meat, food or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. In other words, here it says we're not to judge in foods and drinks. Now, once again, there's nothing about foods and drinks in the Ten Commandments. But the feast days were full of foods and drinks. And Paul is saying here that let no one judge you in those things or in respect of a holy day or of new moons. There's no new moons in the Ten Commandments, but plenty of new moons were kept in the feast days. Or of the Sabbath days, and the Sabbath days here are defined clearly, which are a shadow of things to come. So this is not dealing with the seventh-day Sabbath, because the seventh-day Sabbath was never a shadow of anything. It's talking about the ceremonial Sabbaths that all came into existence after man sinned and pointed forward to those people to help them understand the work that one day Jesus was going to come and do. Get the idea? So that's what the Colossians 2 is talking about. And once again, let me tell you, you get into talking with people and they'll bring this verse up if they know a little bit about the Bible. And if you are clear in your mind, you'll have no trouble uh, helping them. Hebrews 9 goes on to say which was a figure, that is the sanctuary was a symbolic for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats, foods and drinks and diverse washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come as our high priest of good things to come has obtained eternal redemption for us. In other words, Paul is arguing here in Hebrews that um, the, these things were done away with and we're not to uh, observe those things any longer and that's why as a Christian I don't observe the Jewish laws. They had a purpose in the Old Testament but that purpose came to an end when Jesus died on the cross and that's why we don't uh, follow those. Um, and then you can see a parallel. I'm not going to go through all that now. We've read it, but there's a very close parallel between what we read in Colossians 2 and, of course, in Hebrews chapter 9. Both passages refer to the ceremonial sacrificial system of the Old Testament that pointed forward to the good things to come in Christ. All right. Um, yeah, I don't know why that's gone like that, Greg. Right, the sacrificial rituals were a shadow of good things to come in Christ, which are a shadow of good things to come. It says, Hebrews 8, 5, who serve, the, that is the Old Testament priesthood, under the example and shadow of heavenly things. So just as we don't have a, an earthly priesthood on the earth any longer, because that came to an end, because today we have an earth, a heavenly priesthood, isn't that right? That's why in the New Testament it's never priests, it's always priest because there's only one priest now and that's Jesus. Get the idea? And any church that has a priesthood is a counterfeit because they're directing people's attention to an earthly priesthood when the Bible, the New Testament says we're to direct people's attention to the heavenly priesthood of Jesus. 
Hebrews 10, For the law having a shadow of things to come and not the very image of things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. In other words, there was always a failure on the side of the sacrificial system. It couldn't make anyone perfect. So the shadow was the Old Testament sacrifices. The body is the sacrifice of Christ. The shadow was the Old Testament priesthood. The, the reality is the priesthood of Christ. The Old Testament sanctuary was the shadow. The New Testament heavenly sanctuary is the reality. That makes sense? As we go through, yes. Numbers 28 and 29 provide the Old Testament background to the phrase meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of Sabbath days used in Colossians 2.16. It refers to burnt offerings, food, meat, drink offerings prescribed in the daily ceremonial ritual as well as what took place on the weekly Sabbaths, the monthly new moons and the yearly holy days. Uh, because I don't think too many of us are troubled by this, I'm going to keep going. Um, and I don't think we'll spend a lot of time on this now because there's still a fair amount to get through. Um, all right, that's just giving you more evidence because sometimes we have to spend a lot more time on this with folk who are not used to this language. Meat and drink offerings and burnt offerings were prescribed by God for the yearly holy days, the new moons, the weekly Sabbaths, <coughs> and the morning and evening rituals of the Old Testament worship, they all foreshadowed Christ and came to an end at the cross. And as I said, that is the reason why we don't observe them any longer. One of the big confusions that many Christians, usually Sunday keepers, have is the confusion over the moral and the ceremonial laws. Which is the moral law? Ten yes, the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law, was that which came into being at the time of Moses. It was written in a book. And, um, sorry? It was, yes, the Ten Commandments were inside. The law of uh, the ceremonial was in the pocket on the side of the ark. That's correct. That's a very big difference. Um, yes, there it is here. That's the point you're making. This was placed beside the ark there, whereas... This one was placed inside the ark. You know, we're not talking about Noah's ark, we're talking about the ark of the covenant in the sanctuary, in the most holy place. Does Romans 14, 1 to 6, indicate that it makes no difference which day is kept as the Sabbath? What about Romans 14? No, let's have a look at Romans 14 and have a look at the background because this is another favourite verse of those who want to oppose the Sabbath. <clears throat> Paul says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. In other words, don't raise a lot of doubts in people's minds. An imagination, a thought, a reasoning, an opinion um, is what uh, is a doubtful thing. An opinion, yes. All right. Then he goes on to say, Nothing revealed in Scripture could be considered as doubtful or as a human reasoning or opinion. Paul is addressing matters of personal opinion in Romans 14, not matters of law. All right, so what does Romans 14 say? Anti-Sabbath teachers cite verse 5 and part of verse 6 to make their claim that Paul here showed there is no longer any specific day set aside by God for worship. This is what they say, all right? So let's have a look at it. One person esteems one day, this is the text now, one person esteems one day above another and another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. Can you understand why they, why they want to quote this verse? Because on first reading it's suggesting that... Uh, well, if you want to observe the Sabbath, that's fine, but don't push it on me. Well, if you don't want to observe the Sabbath, that's fine. Can you see how they could interpret that? Just reading one person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. I happen to esteem that it doesn't matter. I observe the same day all through the week, it doesn't matter. 
This is one opinion. Another person says, no, we ought to be keeping the Sabbath. And Paul here seems to be saying, let each of you be fully convinced in his own mind. In other words, you make up your own mind as to whether it's right or wrong. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord does not observe it. Now, once again, if you just read something on the surface and don't understand what Paul is, is dealing with, because we've got to understand what's he talking about here. Now, what they were doing is, I think we have got a text here that explains that. Here, well, Let's have a look at the full text. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each of you be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Well, how long would you last if you don't eat? Yeah, it's not talking about the literal eating. It's talking about some specific things that were being done in the early church because what was happening, let's have a look here, I think we've got a... How were the people observing a day? The key words here are he who eats and he who does not eat. This is a specific reference to the spiritual exercise of fasting. This was a matter of personal opinion, an individual choice. Paul is saying that the one who chooses to eat or not eat certain things on certain days should not judge others who think differently. The text has nothing to do with the issue of the Sabbath plainly revealed in Scripture. Now, what, when you go back and have a look at the history, you'll find that the, uh, these Christians were observing, or some believe, that having two days a week fast. Um, I think one was Tuesday and the other was Thursday, as I remember. And some were making a big issue of this. And those who didn't fast were being criticised by those who did fast. Get the idea? You, know, you can understand, I'm, I'm fasting and I feel very holy because I'm doing this and you don't. And I begin to think, well, maybe you're not as spiritual as you could be. Get the idea? This is very easy for humans to think this way. And that's, this is what was happening in the, in the Roman church. And Paul is arguing and saying, look, if a person wants to do that, that's fine. But don't you be critical and, and of someone who doesn't see it exactly the way you see it. Because it's not a matter of biblical stand. This is one man esteems it to be true, and another man esteems it not to be true. So let every man be fully persuaded, because it is not a biblical issue. This was a, uh, a, um, a personal issue that some got involved with and some didn't want to get involved with. Get the idea? And, uh, and that's, that's the background to this. It's got nothing to do with uh, this text does not even mention the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was not an issue in Romans or the New Testament church. The issue was over days regarding as a special by fasting, eating or not eating certain foods on those days. And, uh, and there's always a danger that sometimes in pursuing dietary reform, which is all good, there sometimes can creep into our minds the thinking that because I observe two meals a day or because I am a vegetarian or because I'm this or that, that I have some little superior spiritual standing than someone who doesn't. Get the idea? Perhaps we wouldn't announce it out the front, but sometimes it can creep across our thinking. And that was what was happening in, this ch in the church. So um, the third point, Paul states it makes no difference which day is chosen as a fasting day. The Sabbath was not the issue because uh, that was never left to your mind or my mind or anyone else's mind to choose. On what day did Paul and his companions go to the synagogue at Antioch? The Sabbath. Now this is where p people will say to you, oh, of course Paul kept the Sabbath because that's what the Jews did. Get the idea? So he's, they're trying to negate it by saying, well, we're Christians and that's why we don't uh, go. And Paul was just being in Rome, you do as the Romans do. You know, that, that, that idea? Well, let's read on. 
When the Jews left the synagogue, what did the Gentiles ask? That these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, if Paul didn't observe the Sabbath himself, he would never have encouraged the Gentiles to keep the Sabbath here. Get the idea? So, um, what happened on the next Sabbath? The whole city came together to hear the word of God. Now, not, not, this is not just Jews. This is everybody. The whole city came out. And, um, and then um, Antioch, Poseidon, a whole city of Gentiles came out on Sabbath to hear the word of God. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? All Blacktown came out to keep the Sabbath, yes. Where did Paul meet for Sabbath worship at Philippi? According to Acts 16, 13, to the Riverside. Now once again, if Paul wasn't trying to teach them to keep the Sabbath, why is he meeting them down by the Riverside now? He would have said, now listen, that was alright for the Jews, but now we're Christians, we keep Sunday. But never, never, never does he say that because he continually kept the Sabbath and encouraged the Gentiles and the new believers to be Sabbath keepers. Um, this is the Philippi. This is all that remains of the city of Philippi today. Um, there was no synagogue in Philippi, so Paul on the Sabbath went out of the city to the riverside to meet with those who were meeting there for prayer. So that's what he was saying. That's why they went by the riverside. On the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. So this is a church plant. Planting a new church by the riverside. Didn't have a building. Um, how many Sabbaths did Paul preach Christ and him crucified at Thessalonica? Three Sabbaths. And then it goes on to say in 17, how often did Paul preach to the Jews and the Greeks at Corinth? Every Sabbath. And then it goes on to say, how long was Paul at Corinth? A year and six months. In other words, he was keeping the Sabbath for a year and six months there. That's how important the Sabbath was to Paul. And here was an opportunity if the Sabbath was done away with, why is Paul encouraging the new believers to be Sabbath keepers? if it was done away with. The obvious reason is it wasn't done away with. And Paul knew that, and that's why he was encouraging the new believers. For 78 Sabbaths, Paul preached at Corinth. We have no example from Paul of him ever keeping a single Sunday holy. The only example he left us is that of a faithful Sabbath keeper all the way through his, uh, his life, all right? What does the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews give as an example of the rest that we have in Christ Jesus? God rested on the seventh day from all his works. In other words, once again, Paul is arguing and talking about the Sabbath and says, just as God kept the Sabbath and rested from his works, so it says the Sabbath is a symbol of the spiritual rest we have in Christ. And then it says, does the Sabbath rest still remain for the people of God today. There remains therefore a rest. That word rest there is sabbatismos, the word Sabbath. There remains therefore a Sabbath for the people of God. It remains. It hasn't been done away with. All right. The Greek word translated rest here is sabbatismos, meaning Sabbath rest. It is clear that there still remains a Sabbath rest for the New Testament believers. Is it all right to worship by tradition instead of the commandments of God, according to Mark 7? In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. In other words, if your worship is based on tradition, then um, it uh, is vain worship. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. That's the translation of Mark 7 verse 9. You have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God because human tradition does that. Sunday is founded not on scripture but on tradition and is distinctly a Catholic institution. Catholic record, September 17, 1893. That's a quote from the Catholic Church. 
So they say it's distinctly a Catholic institution. So when people are keeping Sunday, they're acknowledging the fact that's, that the Catholic Church has authority to change the law of God. And uh, I just happen not to, be to believe that at all. Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tra uh, tradition? According to Matthew 15, 3. Whom did Peter say we should obey? According to Acts 5, 29, we ought to obey God rather than men. We always put God first. That's right. We know that verse. How, why should Christians obey Christ? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And uh, love for God always leads to obedience because when we love someone, we want to do the things that please that person and uh, it leads to obedience. The Decalogue, for this is the love of God that we keep his commands and his commandments are not burdensome. That's what John said in his uh, little book of 1 John. Uh, the love of God is that we keep his commandments. People talk, say preach on the love of God. Every time we're preaching on the commandments, we are really upholding the love of Christ. Obedience to God's law is a test of our love to Christ. Which is so true. Joshua said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's commandments against tradition. That's the issue that we've been studying about today. And our last question on our page here, Is it your desire to keep holy God's seventh day Sabbath because you love him and want to take his t this time to develop a deeper relationship with God. And uh, those who are married know that um, marriage, success in marriage swings on whether we allow enough time for communication with one another. That's the very essence of uh, happy marriage. So I hope that you will uh, put the answer there. Yes, I want to. All right, well, let's have a look at... Have we got the envelopes out, um, please, if you don't mind? Yes. Everyone got something to write with? Anyone need a pencil? Just give everyone a, an envelope, that's it, yeah. Good. All right, well, let's put the uh, first quiz up. Uh, yes, oh, it's my, my problem. The Prophecy Seminar Quiz. All right, here's the first question. Jesus changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday when he rose from the dead. True or false? <laughs> That's the first question. Question two. There is no record of any Sunday being kept as a regular day of worship in the New Testament church. There's no record. True or false? Question three. The book of Acts records 84 Sabbaths as kept by the Apostle Paul. The book of Acts records 84 Sabbaths. True or false? Question four, the issue in the Sabbath Sunday question is loyalty to God versus loyalty to the little horn. In other words, the issue over the Sabbath is not a fight over days, it's really a fight over our loyalty. Because who commands the Sabbath? Who commands Sunday? And question five, the New Testament records many instances where Paul and the New Testament church met on the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection. All right, so you've got your answers. Let's have a look. Jesus changed the Sabbath from Sunday, Saturday to Sunday when he rose from the dead. False, right? There is no record of any Sunday being kept as a regular day of worship in the New Testament church. True or false? Did you get true? All right. 
The book of Acts records 84 Sabbaths as kept by the Apostle Paul. True or false? True. The issue in the Sabbath Sunday question is loyalty to God versus loyalty to the little horn. True or false? True. The New Testament records many instances where Paul and the New Testament church met on the seventh day Sabbath after the resurrection. True? Yes. So how do you go with that? That just summarises um, what we've been talking about um, this afternoon. While you've got your envelope there, I've just got a couple of um, points here that you might like to put on your envelope. If it's clear to you that there's only one biblical Seventh-day Sabbath, would you put a tick in the little square opposite number one there? Just put a tick there. And if you're ready to say today that I want to develop that relationship with Jesus by keeping the Sabbath, then put a tick in number two. Tick number two. And if the Sabbath issue is, is uh, clear to you but you don't feel that you're quite ready to keep the Sabbath, just put a tick in number three, if you wouldn't mind, so that we can pray for you and... and uh, Study the Bible more closely. Then if you want to help us, you can. If you can't, that's fine too. So we'll collect those, um, please, if you don't mind, ushers. And then we'll give you next week's lesson. Have you given those out? Good, okay, that's fine. So you've got number 13 lesson now, have you? Anyone without 13? Looks like this one. 13? Does anyone not have this lesson? Okay, looks like we're all cared for. Terrific. All right. Let's just bow our heads in prayer before we uh, go. Lord, I just want to thank you again this afternoon for your love. I thank you for the simplicity and clearness of truth. And the Sabbath question, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to understand very clearly why you have given us the Sabbath so that we might have time to get to know you and to develop a close relationship with you like we do with persons on the earth, with our husband or our wives, with our loved ones. And Lord, that's the purpose of the Sabbath, so that we've got time, we're not too busy. And so Lord, bless us through this week and bring us back again next Saturday afternoon, I pray for Christ's sake. Amen.